started. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. I have got a bunch of poems and music from assorted people. This Oh, I just saw the writing go away. This first piece that I was going to do, I draw things to it as well. This was on the other monitor, is a poem called Communication. And the music that you will hear in the background is music from the Bastard Trio that is in Madison, Wisconsin. They couldn't make the trip, but um, I hope you enjoy this piece. Now that we have the information superhighway, we can throw out into the open our screams, our cries for help so much faster than we could before. <laughs> our pleas become computer blips, tiny bits of energy traveling through razor-thin wires, traveling through space to be left for someone to decipher when they find the time. Once I checked my messages out of voicemail, and Mike left me his pager number, he told me that I had to contact him with some information, and then Steve said to call him at his office between 10.30 and noon, and then Lori told me to check my email because there was a message that I just had to read. So I first returned Steve's phone call, but he wasn't in, so I left a message, and then I dialed the number for Mike's pager, and I listened to a beep, and then I pressed my own number. Then I got online, read some messages, read a note from Ben, emptied out my junk mail. Realizing that I didn't actually get a hold of anybody, I decided to call my friend Sherry, but I got her answering machine. So I said, hi, it's me, Janet. I, I haven't talked to you in a while. At which point I realized there was nothing left to say. <laughs> So, give me a call. We should really get together and talk. I, I checked my email program recently. And the people that I email the most live in the same city as I do. All of whom are a local phone call away. All of whom I know the phone numbers for. In fact, one of my friends lives a block and a half away from me. On the same street as me. But I still email her as much as I call her. When I could just get out of my house, walk down the street, have an actual face-to-face -face conversation with her. Now that we have the information superhighway, we can throw out into the open our screams, our cries for help so much faster than we could before. But what if we don't want to communicate or forget how? Too busy leaving phone messages, emails, pager numbers, voicemails, forgetting to call back. What if we forget how to communicate? Once I explained to my friend Dave how I lost touch with my friend Aaron. I said, you see, we normally email each other and we just hit reply. Now Aaron sent me an email and it had a question at the end. So I hit reply at the end and I had a question at the end of my letter. So we kept having to answer questions to each other. So we just kept replying to each other. Well, once I got an email from him with no question at the end. So I didn't have to send him a response. So I didn't. And we never thought to start a new email to each other. And we just lost touch. And, and then it occurred to me how difficult it had become to type an extra line of text just to type this person's email address because that is the reason why we lost touch with one another. And then it occurred to me, no matter how many different forms of communication we have, we'll still find a way to lose touch with one another. I've got a program for my computer. It's an email or phone book program, and I love this. It sorts people by company. You can list their name and sort things by their phone number. You can keep their birthday, their address, pass addresses and phone numbers, faxes, email addresses. I mean, there is absolutely anything that you could possibly have about them in this file. And I love this program. I keep, I've created a file with all of the phone numbers that I've ever needed. I always add information to this file. I keep a copy of it on my computer at home. I kept a copy of it on my computer at work. I kept it on my laptop. I would actually archive it to a DVD every week. I put it on a backup copy on my archived hard drive. I've copied it to zip disks. And when it was small enough, I actually kept it on floppy disks all the time, you know, 
in case my there was a fire at work and my hard drive crashed. I have it everywhere, I guess. But it always seems that every time I desperately need a phone number, I'm nowhere near any computer. <laughs> now that we have the information superhighway, we can throw out into the open our screams, our cries for help so much faster than we could before. People want an instant message. People want their name as a domain name. People get email accounts. People set up web pages. And you know, I've got a cell phone. I've got a landline. But my phone's not ringing off the hook. It's like I've gone fishing. Sat on a boat on a lake. Put out the bait. And no one's biting. I wanted to get in touch with a friend of mine from high school, Vince, and the last I heard from him, he was off at university, but that was like years ago, and I asked a friend or two that knew him, but they knew where he was, and they had lost touch with him too. So I searched on the internet to see if his name was on a web page or if he had an email address. He didn't, so I figured I just would never get a hold of him. But all of this time, I knew that his parents lived in the same house they always did. I could just call them up and say, Hi, I'm an old high school friend of Vince's. But I never did. And then I realized why. Because you see, I could search the internet for hours and no one would know that I was looking for someone. But now, with a single phone call, I'd make it known to his whole family that I wanted to see him enough to call after all of these years. They didn't want him to know that, so I never called. <laughs> because now that we have the information superhighway, we can throw out into the open our screams, our cries for help, so much faster than we could before. But then the question begs itself, who is there? to listen. I see the artwork being all crazy, so I have no idea what it's looking like. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this next piece, yeah, I have no idea how the you know, the drawings would have been even crazier if I was trying to do that live on the board and the board is shaking it and you wouldn't be able to see it anyway. But this is called Burn It In. And the music is from the Penthouse Playboys, and they're in Chicago. It was actually music that I had on Chaotic Radio, which I was the host for at bzoo.org. So that's music you'll hear in the background for Burn It In. Once I was at a beach off the west coast of Florida. It was New Year's Eve, and the yellow moon hung over the gulf like a swaying lantern. And I was watching the waves crash in front of me with a friend, and the wind picked up, and my friend just stared at that scene for a while. And then he closed his eyes. I, I asked him what he was thinking. He said, I wanted to look at this scene and burn it in my brain, re record it in my mind so that I could just call it up when I want to, so I could have it with me always. I do have my recorders. I burn these things into my brain. I write these things onto pages. I pick and choose what needs to be said, what needs to be remembered. Every year, at the end of every year, I would write in a journal, recall the things that were happening to me, and think of all the memories that I wanted to keep. And that was how I recorded things. That is what kept me sane. That is what kept me alive. When I was younger, I was starting to become a computer science engineer because I wanted to make a lot of money. I wanted to beat everyone else, but I hated what I was doing. And I just thought about all the kids who were in clicks so that others could do the thinking for them because burned into my brain were the evenings of the high school dances that I never went to because burned into my brain were the people that I knew I was better than, who thought that they were better than me. So yeah, I wanted to make a lot of money, I wanted to beat everyone else, but I hated what I was doing. I hated what I saw around me, I hated the pain that people put each other through, and all these memories coming kept flooding me, so to keep me sane, to keep me alive, I wrote down the things I could not say. 
<laughs> what did you think I was doing when I was stuffing handwritten notes into my pockets? I mean, when I saw friends raping my friends, I wrote. I burned into these nightmares with a pen, and yeah, I have this all recorded. So yeah, what did you think I was doing when I was stuffing handwritten notes into my pockets or typing long hours into the night? <laughs> You know, in my spare time, I wouldn't go to the movies and watch other people's stories. I'd sit at the corner of a cafe scribbling into a notebook, or I'd be at a computer lab slamming my fingers, my hands against keyboards, because there were too many atrocities in the world and too many injustices that I had witnessed, too many people who had wronged me, and I had a lot of work to do. <laughs> there had to be a record of what you had done. Uh, did you think your crimes would go unpunished? And did you think that you could come back years later, slap me on the back with a friendly hello, and think that I wouldn't remember? Well, you see, that's what I have my poems for, so there will always be a record of what you had done. Yeah, I have defiled many pages. In your honor, you who swung your battle axe high above your head and thought that no one would remember in the end. Well, I made a point to remember. Yes, I have defiled many pages. And have you defiled many women? You, the man who rapes my friends? You, who rapes my sisters? You, who rapes me? Is that what makes you a strong man? <laughs> do you want to know why I do the things I do? I, I had to record these things. That is what kept me together. When people were dying, that is what kept me together. When I saw my friends going off to war, that is what kept me together. And when I saw my friends being raped and left for dead, that is what kept me together. <laughs> and when no one bothered to notice this, or change this, or care about this, these recordings kept me together. I need to record these things to remind myself of where I came from. I need to record these things to remind myself that there are things to value and things to hate. I need to record these things to remind myself that there are things worth fighting for, worth dying for. I need to record these things to remind myself that I am alive. I can't, I can't be too loud. I'm worried about the microphone. This next piece is a shorter one, and and I hope things are working out with the computers, and thank you to John, and thank you to everyone here. This next piece is called Being God, and no, it's not at all about religion, even though I might be drawing things of religion, it's actually about relationships. tired of dying for your sins over and over again and why is it that I am doing all the dying and you're the one that's doing all the sinning? I don't think you're learning your lesson. I'm tired of taking this knife to my hands over and over again giving myself the stigmata and the blood gets all over my clothes and I can never get the stains out. And for what? For you to see how I suffer? I'm tired of being humble when I'm supposed to be the one with the power. Over and over again, I become your servant, and never are you bowing to me. I don't even get a thank you. I'm tired of preaching the converted, when the converted aren't even really listening. They're snoring in the back rows while I deliver my sermon, and there's not even air conditioning in here, and I'm sweating. I'm tired of coming to you and healing the sick, taking away your problems over and over again, giving you something to look forward to, when all I have is an eternity of waiting for someone to take my place and tend to my wounds. I'm tired of giving the earth up to you, watching the devil's work be done, and you know, he's just sitting down there and looking at me and laughing over and over again, because it's so easy for him when he doesn't have to work. I'm tired of being your salvation. Over and over again, you turn to me, and I have no one to turn to but myself. It's a bitch, you know, being your own god, since no one can save me from me. I'm tired of being your teacher, handing you what you need on a silver platter and waiting for that damn collection plate, and someone is always taking out of it from the back row. I know who you are. You who leave me nothing. 
I'm tired of being something for everybody when everybody is nothing to me. Maybe the devil has the right idea, you know. Maybe I'll just sit back and wait for you to miss me as you wonder, who's your messiah now? Thank you, thank you. He's doing a crowd. Thank you, thank you. I just, I was just watching the things. I don't get to see what's going on on the other guy. But this next piece uh, um, is called Death Takes Many Forms. Um, I didn't get to give credit to the Joanne Powers trio who did the music for the last one. But uh, this next one's from the Ha Man of South Africa. No, there's no way I can get a guy from South Africa to come here. But we've done music together. He'll be touring here in October. But uh, this is called Death Takes Many Forms. It is winter now. And the trees have lost their leaves. The city is covered in a thin layer of soot and snow. The grass is dead. In the sunless sky, black birds circle overhead searching for prey. An eerie cold settles over everything. Nothing is growing anymore. Death takes many forms. For you, death first came when you were five years old, and your mother had to give you three shots of insulin a day until you could take a needle to yourself. Did it hurt to push that needle into your arm the first time? Or did it hurt you more to know you had no choice? Death takes many forms, and death can be someone telling you without trying that they're losing their eyesight. Behind Coke bottle glasses, you would see me and say, that's a nice black suit you're wearing. And I would tell you, it's green. And you wouldn't believe me. You wouldn't hear the howling wind of the changing seasons. Death takes many forms. I know what follows the autumn wind. It is winter now. Uh, do you remember when it happened? Uh, the, the changes are subtle. The temperature drops, first only slightly. It's almost imperceptible. Only when the first snow falls do you realize where all of the seasons have gone. Death takes many forms. Death can be a sweat-soaked shirt The shakes dizziness when you needed food. You would look as pale as a ghost as I would hold your cold, wet arm and study you. Quick, some sugar will make everything better. Isn't everything better yet? Death takes many forms. The, the signs of death can come when you lose your circulation. My feet are numb, Janet. He'd say, I can't feel my feet anymore. And I would rub your feet for you. And you would say it makes a difference. You feel better. If only I could do this forever. Death takes many forms. I said goodbye to you to travel my own road, but I didn't think it was the last goodbye. How was I to know? When I left, I know you didn't want me to go, but now it's my turn. Why are we always saying goodbye to each other? Are you trying to teach me a lesson? Because if you are, well, trust me, I've learned it. You can come back now. Death takes many forms, and now, now it seems you've taken me down with you. Now it seems you've taken me into that casket with you, and I'm running my hand along your jacket lapel, and I can feel the coldness of winter all around me, and I can hear them shoveling the dirt over my head, and I want to get out, and I want to take you with me. I don't Death takes many forms. Death could be that hole you left. You know, right over there, just a little to the left. I keep wondering when the pain will go away, when everything will be better. <laughs> he once showed me that winters could be beautiful. Instead of the dark and dirty snow lacing the city streets, you showed me a quieting snowfall over a lake at your parents' backyard, glistening in an untouched whiteness. I told you I hated winters. And you told me, this you don't hate. 
Well, I'm still learning. It is winter now, and death takes many forms. The seasons change for you and I. It is snowing, and something is ending. It is snowing. Somewhere, it is snowing. Next piece, as I see, it was drawing. It was everything was alive and dying. Not mine. <laughs> and once again, we've got a uh, man of South Africa on the music in the background. Hope you enjoy. <sighs> I had a dream the other night. I walked out of a city to a forest, and there were neatly paved bicycle paths and trash cans every 50 feet and trash every 10. And then a, rac a little raccoon came right up to me, and she had a few little baby raccoons following her. <laughs> it was so cute. I, I wish I had my camera. And she spoke to me, and she said, Thank you for not buying furs. I know you humans are pretty smart. You've got to be able to figure out a way to keep yourselves warm without killing me. And I said, You know they don't do it for warmth. They, they do it for fashion. They do it for power. And she said, I know, but thank you anyway. And then I walked a little further, and there was a stray cat. And she still had a little collar on with a little bell. And she walked a few feet, stretched her front paws. Oh, she looked so darling. <laughs> and then she walked right up to me, and she said, thank you. And I said, for what? And she just looked at me for a moment. Her little ears were standing straight up. And she said, in some countries, I'm considered a delicacy. <laughs> and I said, uh, how, how do you know of these things? And she said, when somebody eats one of you, word gets around. And then she just looked at me for a minute and then she said, and in some countries, the cow is sacred. And wouldn't they love to see how you humans prepare them for slaughter, how you hang them upside down and slit their throats so their still beating hearts will drain out all the blood for you. And then she said, isn't it funny how arbitrary your decision to eat meat is? And I said, d d d don't put me in that category. I don't eat meat. And she said, I know. And then I walked deeper into the forest, managed to get away from the picnic tables and the outhouses that lined the forest edges. And the roaring cars gave way to the rustling of tree branches, crackling of fallen leaves under my step. When the wind tunneled through, the wind whistled and sang as it flew past the bark and leaves. I walked, listened to the crack of dead branches under my feet, and I felt a branch against my shoulder, and I looked up and it was as if I could hear the trees speak to me. And they said, thank you for letting the endangered animals live here amongst us. We, we do think they are so pretty, and it would be a shame to see them go. And thank you for recycling paper, because you're saving us for just a little while longer. We've been on this planet for so long, embedded in the earth, we do have souls, you know. You can hear it with our songs. We cling with our roots. We don't want to let go. I said, but I don't do much. I don't do enough. And they said, we know, but we'll take what we can get. And then I woke up in a sweat. So tell me Bob Dole, so tell me Newt Gingrich, so tell me Pat Buchanan, so tell me Jesse Helms. If you woke up from that dream, would you be in a sweat too? I mean, do you even know why we should save the rainforest? Oh, preserve the delicate balance. Just tear the whole forest down. What difference does it make? Put in some orange groves or a concentrate orange juice can be a little cheaper. Did you know that medical researchers have a very, very difficult time trying to come up with synthetic cures for diseases on their own? It, it first, it helps them out if they can first find that substance in nature. And a tree in the rainforest with a cure may be the only one of its species, or one like it maybe two miles away from it instead of right next to it. I wonder how many cures we've destroyed to plant more orange groves. It serves us right. 
You know, my motives aren't selfless. I know that these things are worthwhile in my life. I'd like to find a cure to these diseases before I die of them. And I'm not just a vegetarian because I think it's wrong to kill an animal unless I have to. I also know the excess protein from eating animals pulls the calcium away from my bones and gives me osteoporosis. And I know that the excess fat gives me heart attacks. And I also know that we could be feeding ten times more people with the same resources used for meat production. You know, I know you're looking at me and calling me an extremist, but I'm sitting here looking around me, looking at all the destruction caused by family values and thinking that the right, moral, non-violent decisions are also those extreme ones. Everything is linked here. We destroy our animals so we can be wasteful and violent. We destroy our plants. We destroy our air. We're even destroying our earth. We wreak havoc on the soil, on the atmosphere. We, we dump our wastes into our lakes. We pump aerosol cans and exhaust fumes. And you tell me I'm extreme? Uh, and these animals and forests keep calling out to me. The oceans, the wind. And I'm beginning to think that we just keep doing it because we don't know how to stop. And deep inside we feel the pain of all that we killed and we try to control it by popping a chemical-filled painkiller. And we live through the guilt by taking caffeine, nicotine, morphine, and we keep ourselves thin with saccharin, and we keep ourselves sane with our alcohol poisoning. Then when that's not enough, maybe a line of coke, or maybe shoot ourselves in the head in front of the mirror in the master bathroom or maybe just take some pills walk into the garage turn on the car and just fall asleep in the wild you have no power over anyone else now that we're civilized we create our own wild maybe when we have this power our only choice, the only choice we have, is to destroy ourselves. And so we do. Oh, I see another one. What am I writing? Oh, that's True Happiness in the New Millennium. This is a fun one. Sorry. Um, David Michael Jackson of the DMJ are connected to the music for this off of our first CD. You can find out about that if you'd like, but he's off in Tennessee. He never gets up here. So this is True Happiness in the New Millennium. The only to freedom is freedom from the heart's desires. And the only true happiness this way lies. I'm here to restaurate a whole new millennium. I'm the new savior, the savior of science, the savior of strength, the savior of survival, survival of the fittest, survival of the best. And I'm here to tell you that we're starting in new. So fasten your seatbelts, hang on to your hats, place your seat trays into their upright and locked position, or it's a bumpy ride. And I'm here to tell you why. I'm here to usher in a whole new millennium, the millennium of reason and logic and strength. And I don't want to hear about your self-destruction. I don't want to hear about your whining, psychosis, your depression, suicide, alcohol, and drugs. And just what made you think that playing with needles and escape would make things better somehow? God, I've always hated needles anyway. What is it with you people? Well, you need a leader, and I'm stepping up to the plate. You keep asking for a big brother, and I'm here to set you straight. You want someone to wipe your noses for you? Well, pick up the damn tissue and do it yourself. Because when you give up your rights, you take away mine. And we're not having any of that. I'm here to usher in a whole new millennium. And you say to me that you need crystal meth so that you can stay awake through work. And you say to me that you don't need to drink, that you just like the taste. And you say to me that with all of your escapism, you still can't feel any better. And you say to me that sometimes suicide is the only answer. But I'm here to usher in a whole new millennium. I'm here to usher in a whole new generation. So stop asking for things and start working for things. Because X is for ecstasy as long as it's fast. And X is for extra. But there's always a cost. And ecstasy doesn't come without extra work no matter how many corners you cut. And you know, X is for X-ray. And I see right through that.
They say that Eve ate from the tree of knowledge. But you know, she shouldn't have stopped just there because the loggers are raping the trees of knowledge. The loggers are raping the trees, the forests of talent, the forests of ability, the forests of reason, of skill, of logic, perseverance, and life. We're letting them rape the forests of excellence and you know it's now time to take it all back because I'm here to usher in a whole new millennium and I'm here to tell you how it's gonna be done. You're asking your leaders to save you from yourself. But your leaders are losers, and they're worse off than you. I'm here to rush in a whole new millennium, where it's time to take charge, and it's time to fess up. Only you can deliver you from your own front sins, but first you must know what sin really is. It's time to make choices, and it's time to lay claim to everything that we've been blindly giving away, because I'm here to usher in a whole new millennium. Take charge of yourself, and I'll take charge of me. I'm my leader, not yours. Wave your own damn noses. Take it in your own hands, people. Mold your own tools. This is the new millennium, and this is your chance. No one should be showing us how to fail. People mastered that feat a millennia ago. So set your own rules and do something fast, because it's time to take charge, and it's time to be alive. I'm here to usher an old new millennium, and I'm waiting for you to usher in yours. Because true happiness, this way lies, my friend. And I won't wait long if you lag, lag behind, because I'm setting my rules, so step out of my way. I'm here to tell you that there's a new sensation, and I'm here to tell you that there's a new salvation. And the only true happiness, this way lies. This is the last piece, and it's called I'm Not Sick. I should wait for myself to write it out. I'm not sick, but I'm not well. I want to thank, actually, I'm going to first thank John because he's managing all this stuff over here while I'm not able to do it while I'm up here on stage. And I should also thank him for the guitar strummings that you'll hear in the next track. And I'd like to thank Moira. Thank you, thank you. And thank everybody at Swing State. Thank you so very much. You guys are the ones that deserve the applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> this is I'm Not Sick, But I'm Not Well. I'm not sick, but I'm not well, and I'm sure there's something I can do about this. I've got the aspirin, the Tylenol, the ibuprofen, the codeine, the Prozac, the sleeping pills, and that thermometer is down my throat, and I'm gagging. <laughs> I'm not sick, but I'm not well. The doctors can find nothing wrong with me, and believe me, they've taken the x-rays, and they've slipped, stripped me down, maybe wore one of those god-awful paper robes, and they felt me up, and they checked me out, and they found what they were looking for, but they didn't find anything I was looking for. I'm not sick, but I'm not well, and I can't help but think that everything I'm doing to make things better might only be making things worse. So, I don't want to listen to what you have to say to me anymore, and I want this IV out of my arm, and I want this oxygen tube out of my nose, and I want that suppository out of my ass, and I want you to get that scalpel away from me, because I want everything I've got. I'm not sick, but I'm not well, and they want me if they can keep me in line, and they want me if they can cut me open, and cut out the insides, and suck up the fat, and suck up the life, and make me generic, and make me dependent, and make me unreal, make me unwhole. And I've walked that line with all of you doctors, and I want all my parts back, and I want to be healthy. No, I'm not sick, and maybe I'm not well. But you're only making me worse. I don't have the answers, but neither do you. So instead of tearing me apart and dissecting me and studying the bones, let me just stay together for a while until I figure it all out. No idea if the projectors were doing it. Worked. It worked. No, they worked really well. Awesome. I was Very trying. Well. I was trying. I'll show you a picture. <laughs> I got photos. We. I can Facebook them. Wee. Yeah, once, once the internet works on my computer, I can upload them. Oh. The technology highway. <laughs> on the internet super highway, we can throw out our screens. Our cries for help is so much faster than we did before. But the on ramp's not working. Here. <laughs> the on ramp's not working. The internet, the internet super highway is not working. Only on my computer, apparently. <laughs> Now I have to take stuff down so we can do stuff.
What did you blow up, Ian? It was all my fault. I'm going to...